Gearbox Games boss Randy Pitchford certainly is a talker, something that's made him somewhat of a controversial figure amongst the more vocal elements of the industry, especially with the discussion surrounding his latest game, Borderlands 3. As much as I knew he was a talker, well, I hardly expected a 2,500 word essay on Twitter. Have you ever heard of Medium, Randy? But anyway, more importantly, he touched on the differences between Valve and Epic and the future landscape of the industry. So, once more, we have a lot to talk about. Hey everyone, and welcome back to another report. So, today we're going to be going fairly deep into the differences between Epic and Valve and the similarities between Borderlands 3 and Half-Life 2 in regards to their broader business goals as games plus far more. And all of this is through the lens of Randy Pitchford's latest tweet storm, which, as divisive as parts of it uh, may have actually been, does actually cover a lot of ground that we really should talk about, because as much as people and events are fine, ideas are what really matters here. Now, for me, the core theme of all of this is that growth typically comes at the cost of a bit of chaos. That's really how stuff's always worked, even if you look at the real world. You know, we see rising income equality, and you generally see that that does track with progress. Now, sure, in the 1200s, the local lord had a lot more power and money than anyone else, but they still had a friggin' chamber pot and all of the problems of the time. Our extreme progress lately has led to a bit of a centralization of power and wealth and all that stuff. Most people, of course, have benefited from this massively. Just look at where we are and what we have. But the overall instability that's now sort of appearing in developed countries is perhaps us paying down the price for the growth that we've had since the recession. Now look, gaming is not as grand a topic as that, but gaming is the thing that we're all here for. More stores means more competition, and in terms of access to capital, of course, Epic probably are the largest yet, allowing them to grow extremely aggressively uh, through all sorts of means. Now, this fast growth has led to a bit of chaos, with people understandably not really liking arbitrary exclusives. I know that I certainly don't. Now, of the newcomer stores, as I said, Epic has really the most money behind it. They're trying to use that to grow fast. The faster they grow, while well, the more aggressive their tactics have to be, leading to more chaos. Has this managed to provoke a response from the rest of the industry? That's the big question. Well, Valve now have a 75-25 and 80-20 split. That's a great move for the industry. Epic and Discord, together with their stores, have pressed Valve to do that. Now, that's great for some devs, but those tiers only kick in after $10 million and $50 million in revenue, and personally, I'll only be satisfied once Valve have a more indie developer-friendly split. Now, of course, I do say that planning to benefit from it, but it is also true that indies generally run on tighter margins and I think, personally, are essential to the creative progress of the industry and, uh, frankly, I think they need the money a bit more than EA do. So, moving on to Randy. Well, he is overall pro-competition and pro-progress. Now, I think most of us are pro-competition, but there's a fundamental difference between, I think, many of the gaming audience and Randy. Really, from my read of his tweets, and I'm trying to be as fair as I can, I think that he believes that the ends somewhat justify the means, and that the chaos creates created by those means is a reasonable price to pay. What are those means? Well, it's that Epic are not growing organically and slowly by providing a better product to customers. They're instead growing fast by using their capital to blast through the competition with exclusivity deals. By doing this, they do actually force consumers who want some of those exclusive games into a worse experience than they would get with Steam, particularly just because of how much worse their store and their platform is. So, with this stuff covered, let's go through Randy's massive statement. He begins by pointing out that 2K are the people who made the final call with Borderlands 3, and uh, he then talked about how Steam, you know, do indeed have more features, and that some of Steam's features are not a part of Epic's plan, but that equally, Epic may have some planned features that Steam won't implement. Both companies have... I think very different opinions on, say, store reviews, with Epic planning for them to be opt-in, which is very much unlike Valve, who really seem to see reviews as having a way for their users to create, uh, curate the store, uh, and therefore, of course, Steam reviews are always on. Now, Randy said the Epic Store will have more features once Borderlands 3 launches, but um, that if they don't, well, Borderlands 3 is a really big game, so Epic would suffer from not having those features. He said that Borderlands is a forcing function on Epic, something that will push them to make improvements. Randy said, 
said that the pressure exerted by such a large launch as what Borderlands 3 will be is something that is good for gamers because it will push Epic to make their store better. Now, factually, I think Randy pretty much is right there. It will be a forcing function. It will pressure Epic to make their store better. But the thing is, customers don't really care about that right now because of the PR damage that Epic have inflicted upon themselves. I think it's very important for the developers to understand that. Everything that they say might actually be right, but they're in a position where customers have been aggravated by Epic to the point of them not really caring. And I think this does pose quite the communication challenge for everyone involved, and indeed I have done a video about that communication challenge. I actually think that Tim Sweeney, the Epic CEO, has probably handled the communications the best. He's just been pretty darn frank about what they're doing, which at least is honest. Unfortunately, the same can't be said for many devs, Randy included, who have sometimes lashed out. So Randy goes on to talk about the Epic roadmap, and how all of the epic incentives, you know, will drive them to develop the store as fast as they can. He then starts to get on to, I think, the more interesting topic, which is the values of Valve as compared to Epic. Now, he does acknowledge that there is a chance that the Epic Games Store will not be in a great state for Borderlands 3 while he's talking about this, and how that is a risk factor for the game's publisher, 2K, and uh, how he's happy that that risk is being taken because, from Randy's perspective, he really is thinking about the long-term state of the industry. Again, and that's really showing that he doesn't care too much for the current problems that are being faced by the consumers, and he's more fixated on the 10 to 20 year uh, plan and how the business models of the storefronts will change in that sort of time span. And he does go into some decently interesting stuff. He opens up by saying that he has, of course, worked with both Epic and Valve. Uh, now, you know, Gearbox's Half-Life expansions are what put them on the map. They've licensed the Unreal Engine, and they were the retail publisher for Fortnite. Based on his experience, Randy said that he believes that Epic's technology investment will outpace Valve substantially, saying that he thinks we will look back at Steam in 10 years and see a dying store with others having uh, taken its place. That's a really big statement, uh, given how people are very attached to Steam, and indeed how people have a lot of money put into the Steam platform. It's perhaps bombastic to the point of making him more enemies than friends, I guess? So first, Randy says that he doesn't really see publisher-owned stores as being true competition to Steam because they have an inherent bias that will always go towards their own games. And I think that is a, like that is essentially spot on given uh, the choice between like you know owning a third-party game on Origin or Steam. Just about everyone will choose Steam. Uh, he then says that something that compounds in all of this is how much developers trust Epic. And I think that is true. By Epic making their engine better, giving it better tools, and being more competitive with their licensing fee, they well they've given devs better tools and they've made their engine cheaper, which has been something that's trickled down to customers with better games. So Randy said that they have all came to trust and rely upon Epic's um, fair play and goodwill. Now from a purely development perspective, you really can see why someone would think that given the last, what, 20 years? It's just that for the last months, uh, for the last six months, that's a statement that's not going to play well with audiences, who by this stage associate Epic more with an aggressive storefront uh, than Epic being the people who've made an engine that has powered many of their favorite games. You know, take like Mass Effect and, you know, stuff like that. Uh, now, where things get interesting is the financial incentive. So Randy's basic point here is that he says Valve are private and can do whatever they want, be it, you know, develop their product or enrich themselves. Uh, he says that while Epic is still private, that it now has more external influences and far more pressure to grow fast. Essentially, for Valve's founders, Randy says that they will get rich from taking the company's money, but for Epix, they will get rich by growing the company's valuation and therefore making money based on the worth of their stock increasing. So for Randy, this seems to be the core of why he is very sure that Epic will continually reinvest into the growth of the Epic Store and its development. He overall thinks that this is going to cause Epic to grow faster than Valve and that Valve will be forced to respond, but he also thinks that Valve will be beaten out, um, eventually saying that everybody will benefit from that competition. And you know, it's an interesting point, but I think there is one side to this that he's not really touching, and I think it's a side that customers will feel very strongly. If you get really rich, not through making money from your customers, but by increasing your valuation, uh, well, that's going to result in some pretty interesting behavior, because often the fastest way to grow is not by directly serving your customers, it's maybe by doing things like FIFA Ultimate Team, uh, mandating live services across your company, things like that. So while Randy is right about the growth incentives, I think it's worth noting that 
that those incentives produce different results. I think by being private, well, Valve are free to do whatever the hell they think is best, be that for themselves or their customers. They're not really forced to do things that their customers won't like for the sake of their own growth. I think customers do feel this. Valve does not do exclusives and they have invested in a pretty robust feature set. Those are all things that have made customers' gaming lives better. Now sure, Epic might get the growth, but they might get it in a way that is not as well aligned with the customer's experience. Being private means that Valve can just do whatever the hell they want. They're less influenced by that need for growth, which is something that I does think, or I do think allows them to just basically have a stronger customer relationship. Now, Randy does go on to claim that he bets that Epic will surpass Valve in terms of features and quality of service, and that Epic is just set up differently with shareholders that are very much are growth motivated. And once again, I think this could be true depending on Valve's response, but it's worth noting that as Randy pointed out later, Valve and Epic have very different ideas of what their store feature set should be. Things like the always on reviews that are loved by customers and are a great tool, but are not something that Epic plans to support. Instead, their reviews will be developer opt-in. He goes on to say that just overall, the whole thing is a gift to gamers, developers, and publishers. And you know, it's an interesting one because will gamers eventually benefit from the competition? Yeah, they probably will, but the thing that many devs and publishers I think are underplaying is that right now the customers don't feel that benefit because of how underdeveloped the Epic Store is and basically how the exclusives are forcing them into a worse overall experience. So yeah, 8812 really is better for everyone, but this is a case of long-term versus short-term and the consequences of the rate of growth really what I touched on at the start of this video. Now, the whole exchange gets a bit bizarre when Randy sort of pitches himself as a messiah figure. Uh, he says that Activision Blizzard and EA won't take the risk to force innovation, and yeah, that's pretty true, I suppose. Um, but the Take-Two and Borderlands will, saying that it took Half-Life 2 to make people uh, take the Steam pill, and uh, you know, even then, barely so. And yes, by the way, Steam was hated back in the day, I even remember that, and I was 10 years old when I first installed Steam. Uh, so Randy then rather grandiosely talks about how Borderlands 3 is going to grow epic, uh, force competition, and uh, I mean, save gaming. I mean, Randy gets a bit excitable, let's be real here. I think it does often end up with him coming off as being a bit egotistical and uh, sort of easily set off. And I think it makes him a poor messenger for many of the, these points, as the message and the messenger tend to get muddled. Uh, look, I recommend reading the man's words though with this. They are all compiled on the PC gaming subreddit, so it's a great place to hit up. Really for me, it's what I started off this video with saying. The more aggressive the growth, the more disruptive the means by which that growth is achieved. In this case, it's great for developers and for publishers, but it right now is at the cost of the customer's experience. That's what happens when a developer can make more money by selling less games. It breaks the usual system of incentives that essentially forces developers to be aligned with what customers want. And look, we probably will get through this. Personally, a future where Steam is maybe 80-20 with loads of features, and Epic is 88-12 with maybe fewer features. I think that would be great. Consumers would have choice, developers would get more money from the games that they sell, it's just for me really sad that the well of goodwill has been poisoned by these darn exclusives. I really wish Epic had have just given it a year of growing organically by just giving people a good product. But they didn't do that. That does, uh, that does make me a bit sad. I really hope we'll get through this, and I think that maybe in five years, this could be a better thing. And it could be better in a way that's kind of hard to quantify. Put it this way, if between Epic and Steam, we maybe see another 10 to 15% of the store cut, you know, go to uh, go to consumers. So maybe, you know, Steam opens up their, uh, their 80, 20 or something like that to more indie developers. What you'll see is that indie games will have a higher success rate. You just, you know, you won't really, this is the sort of thing where it's like, if you look at the trend over time, over 10 years, you probably see, you know, the amount of successful games. And then whenever the store cut change happens, you'd know, probably see that spike up. And that probably would mean a more healthy, more vibrant indie scene. And I think that's really good for the creativity of games. And ultimately that's what I care about the most. That's why I want these cuts to go down. It's just, as I said, yeah, for me, I'm really sad that it's had to happen in a way that inconveniences customers and makes that worse. Because one of the most sacred things is the relationship between the creator and the customer. And things like this, they really risk damaging that. And if it happens too much, that damage can stick. 
And when I look at what publishers have been doing over the last 10 years, when I look at things like this, I'm beginning to think to myself, you know what, this damage is beginning to stick. And I have no idea if, if that would be damaging to the industry if it sticks, how damaging it would be. It's just something that I feel and I'm kind of worried about. So overall, just to leave you, what would you like the gaming landscape to look like in five years? Let me know down below. There's loads more content on this channel, so be sure to check it out. And uh, yeah, thank you for watching. I'll see you next time.